Today, we're going to be launching a presentation from the Global Initiative called Stronger Together, Bolstering Resilience Among Civil Society in the Western Balkans. My colleague, Christina Ammerhauser, will present the main findings of the report. Then we'll have some insights from civil society from the region. We have four experts uh, with us today who will give us the perspective from their country and also the particular topic that they have been working on. We have Ivan Stefanovsky from North Macedonia, Milan Stefanovic from Serbia, Almira Music from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Kenan Bardai from Kosovo. And it's also a real pleasure for me to uh, say that we have with us today as well Dunja Mijatovic, the Commissioner for Human Rights from the Council of Europe, who is a very busy lady, and I'm glad that she's given us uh, some of her time this morning to provide reflections on the report, but also the conversation that we'll be having to uh, give some feedback from her perspective with her knowledge of the region, with her knowledge on freedom of the media and human rights. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the German Foreign Ministry for making this project possible. It's been a really great project, as you'll see in a few moments. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the Global Initiative Resilience Fund, with whom we've been working very closely, and of course, all our civil society partners in the region. And uh, we're very much showcasing their work today. If you're interested, we've also made a, a video which features some of the civil society uh, organizations. And I see some of them on the screen here today, including Darian. Please uh, check that out and uh, spread the word. It's, it's very interesting and worth having a look as a kind of compliment to the report. Without any further ado, I'd like to pass the floor over to Christina to share with you some of the main findings of our report. Christina. Thank you very much, Walter. This report is the result of a project which allowed us to work with and support the uh, civil society organizations in the Western Balkans through the Resilience Fund. And it gave us really the opportunity to get to know a lot of you better, better understand the context in which civil society is operating across the region, as well as the challenges and opportunity within the sector. It is also the result of more than 100 interviews conducted between September and November last year which uh, we conducted in all of the six Western Balkan countries. And we discussed and uh, tested the preliminary findings um, at six national resilience dialogues. And also during a three day meeting with civil society in early December to finalize the recommendations. Also uh, up front from me, a really big thank you to everybody who has been part of this project. And I'm really happy to see that many of you are also present here today. Um, I want to start with a quick snapshot of um, civil society in the region and civil society represents an important voice in uh, the Western Balkans with a long history and a wide portfolio. According to the national registries that we've consulted more than 100,000 civil society organizations are registered across the region and most of them work on topics such as human rights, democratization, rule of law, culture, youth, education, even environment and economic reforms. But there are only few organizations that focus on corruption and even fewer on organized crime. And this can see, be seen here on the table as well, um, which shows that less than 1% of the CSO registered in each country work across the region to alleviate the vulnerabilities against organized crime and corruption. For example, by focusing on drug issues, violence, gender, post penal assistance and other things. And the mapping we, um, we conducted also showed that the space for civil society um, to do these things is shrinking in the Western Balkans as they are under pressure by government and criminal actors. Um, during our research, civil society organizations um, explained that it's comparably easy to set up an NGO, but problems come when you run it and when you try keeping it sustainable. A lot of organizations face common challenges, which include bureaucratic hurdles, financial unpredictability, low capacity of staff, um, because many are just hired on a project um, basis or on a honorarium basis. Um, we've noted that civil society organizations in the Western Balkans are funded both by international donors, government and the private sector. 
And um, most organizations that we've interviewed reported that they receive primarily international funding, but mentioned that this is often short term focuses on bigger cities and there are actually there's little attention and support for activities against organized crime. And this leaves many CSOs little room to diversify or to specialize on issues that they think um, are important in their communities. Um, ne so, but nevertheless, many uh, civil society organizations prefer international funding because government funding um, is described as opaque and comes with strings attached. The report we're presenting today shows that money often goes to organizations close to the ruling party, while independent and community based initiatives have few chances of winning tenders. Um, this also led to the creation of a parallel civil society, so-called gongos, to reward people loyal to those in power and showcase cooperation to international donors. Many civil society representatives we spoke to are very critical of this existence and influence of gongos, although they often disagreed on how to tackle the problem, as they do not want to be perceived as just fighting over money. Um, we also observed the fundamental lack of trust on both sides from the government and from civil society. Um, this leads to the fact that civil society organizations are sometimes perceived as anti-governmental rather than non-governmental, which puts them in an awkward position and kind of undermines their apolitical role. Uh, the fact that they receive little support from the government also reinforces that gen civil society generally is perceived as an outsider within the community itself. And so many civil society organizations feel trapped in a sort of dual relationship with their government. On the one hand, they work as a watchdog to the government, while on the other hand, they recognize that it is necessary to work with them to advance common goals. And in fact, uh, we've observed a degree of cooperation of most civil society organizations in all of the countries. Um, just very quickly um, to move forward, um, organized crime and corruption require a holistic response, one that includes the participation of the government and of civil society. In our work, we observe that organized crime thrives where there is vulnerability and civil society can play an important role to counteract that by strengthening local resilience. This includes working with youth, drug issues, post-prison reintegration, anti-corruption, environmental issues, marginalized groups, um, and working on violence against women, etc. A community resilience approach also involves understanding how different forms of organized crime are part of the local culture and how they impact local lives. And therefore, it is important to identify the local vulnerabilities and risks faced by the communities and strengthen the key actors and structures to counteract that. Here on this map, which um, we, we've put together um, as a result of the research, you can see we've identified civil society organizations addressing these vulnerabilities across the region. And um, we've observed that really each community has a different approach on how to counter the local forms of organized crime and corruption. And that in each case, the activities were creatively tailored to the local audiences and involved the communities at all levels of the process. We also observed that most of the society actors in the region are passionate about their communities and committed to contributing to their development but many lack the capacity, knowledge, and experience to counter organized crime in a coherent manner and within criminalized systems. Um, despite the fact that every community has a different approach on how to counter organized crime, we have observed that there can exist certain common entry points, activities that have worked particularly well, um, and types of organizations that are well received. And so I just quickly want to introduce uh, four of these organizations. And the first one is youth organizations. There's a large number of youth organizations across the region and they are present in smaller communities and they and their staff are very well respected, not only by the constituency, but also broadly supported by local government structures. And they really play an important role in um, in young people's lives as they offer spaces where to spend the afternoon, 
getting children off the uh, streets, which makes it more difficult for gangs to recruit new members and also provides alternative narratives for those that are already engaged in organized crime. Um, the second category then is social enterprises, which is a relatively new concept in the Western Balkans. They consist usually of two elements, a coffee shop or a hostel or something, which is kind of the business element and a social element, which focuses on the well-being of the community. And social businesses create an important link between the private sector and civil society. They provide staff with uh, job experiences. They create opportunities to make uh, the business more self-sustainable. Um, in the Western Balkans, so there are successful examples, although not all of them are yet uh, self-sustainable. And some to mention are, for example, in Albania, where they're running coffee shops and hostels, or in Serbia, where one is running a moving company and relocation company. Um, the next um, common entry point is service providing CSOs. Um, many civil society organizations across the region uh, deliver important services to both the victims of organized crime, for example, through shelters or hotlines, but also to former perpetrators in the form of post penal assistance. And I just quickly want to highlight here the important role of uh, drop in centers. For example, for drug users, these are networks across a country supporting a wide range uh, of people and provide a wide area of services from the distribution to syringes to psychological support and free consultations. And finally, um, the key, um, another key entry point are local media organizations. They increase the knowledge base um, on organized crime. And for this reason, they're often under pressure by the government who are more interested in, in keeping the information a secret. Um, it is also important to notice that many media organizations not only increase awareness on the topic, but also provide uh, platforms of community debate and to train young journalists in new research um, methodologies. Just before I conclude, I would like to point out um, and point to the risks that civil society and journalists face when standing up to the status quo and strengthening resilience against organized crime. Many organizations that we've talked to across the region expressed a strong concern for their community, in particular with regards to security, but also reputational and legal risks, especially civil society organizations in smaller towns and villages where there are few resilience actors feel exposed and are often reluctant to raise um, their concerns. And many of them are not part of national, regional or international networks and vulnerable to pressure from criminal groups and local governments. Um, so for the way forward, um, two key points. The first point is about networks. Uh, they need to be strengthened, not only on a local and national level, but also on a cross regional and global level. Uh, strategic partnerships need to be built across sectors. Civil society needs to increase the cooperation and support amongst each other, especially amongst media and NGOs, and they need to follow up on each other's work. Uh, for example, CSO could initiate criminal proceedings in front of the competent state authorities. Uh, work together with media to publish stories with the relevant evidence of crime and corruption. And um, the second point is uh, that issues of organized crime and corruption need to be brought closer to the community and their impact explained in an easy and understandable manner. Civil society needs to communicate its message more clearly to shape the discourse on organized crime and messages of awareness on the impact of organized crime on everyday life need to be increased and to reach as many people as possible. It is important to stop the feeling of impunity. To conclude, um, civil society needs to preserve its independence and objectivity while promoting social change. They can provide role models for young people and lead by example. But civil society cannot dress address the issues that uh, are raised here today on its own, but uh, they are need to be part of a more holistic response against organized crime, which includes both the government 
and civil society. Um, I'll stop here. Please feel free to uh, put questions and comments in the chat box um, and we're happy to discuss them later. And um, yeah, without further ado, I think I'll hand over to Ivan Stefanovsky, the executive director of Eurothink based in North Macedonia for his input. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, for the presentation of, of this report. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, good morning and greetings from Skopje. I'm very glad to address you here today upon the invitation of the Global Initiative through its Resilience Fund. And I'm very happy to see a lot of familiar faces today uh, with us. So uh, in terms of, uh, of what Eurothink does to strengthen community resilience, so apart from conducting research and analysis, since we're primarily a think tank, Eurothink is also a do think and an educational center, which is trying to reach out to multiple stakeholders, such as grassroots, local journalists, local members of the youth, but as well as local decision makers. So, uh, within our resilience fund supported project, which was mainly dedicated to, to mapping um, uh, forms of uh, organized crime and illegal logging and strengthening community resilience to illegal logging. Uh, we organized eight community events across the country in, uh, in previously detected hotspots where illegal logging was and still is unfortunately massive. Uh, we also organized one central national event, reaching out to both through the local and the central events, mainly to economically marginalized communities, which um, have been direct or indirect victims of illegal logging. Uh, additionally, we use the advantages of social media and by producing eight targeted infographics and one educational video, we managed to reach out to more than 700, uh, 730,000 citizens in North Macedonia, which is basically one third of the country, uh, of the country's population, increasing uh, their knowledge on damage caused by illegal logging to Macedonian society. Uh, I, uh, all, all the infographics and the educational videos are available uh, on our website and on our social media profiles. But just to give you a greater picture of what they contain, basically each of the targeted infographics uh, presented the hotspots of illegal logging in a certain uh, community. Then it provided the, the um, lines where one could report to the to the local uh, to the local forestry police authorities but also the the uh, national landline for um, managed by the public enterprise national forests then we also tried to to map particular uh, particular damages caused to the environment by illegal logging uh, and other threats to society going beyond uh, beyond ecology and uh, economy. In terms in terms of the educational video, it also uh, uh, consisted of three parts. One was uh, raising the raising the uh, issue of illegal logging and the damage it it causes to society. Then there was uh, an element providing statistics of how uh, state institutions in Macedonia work or do not or work much and enforce their competencies in terms of preventing illegal logging and processing uh, uh, organized criminal activities related to illegal logging. While the last part of the educational video was more of an empowering one in order to mobilize citizens and communities as much as possible. Um, apart from this project, uh, Eurothing is also a part of the Western Balkans Organized Crime Radar, where in coordination with our partner organi organizations from the region, uh, we try to strengthen the capacities of CSOs to lend a hand in fighting organized crime from below. And here we organize 
online workshops. It would have been great if these workshops could have been organized face to face, but unfortunately, uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we, we stuck to uh, having them uh, online. Additionally, Eurothink traditionally organizes the annual School of European Politics. And it was exactly uh, during this year of pandemic that we held our first online school, which was the sixth one uh, in a row. And one of the nine sessions that we had this year was dedicated uh, exclusively to CSO's efforts in fighting organized crime in the Western Balkans. So through the School of European Politics, we try to reach out to professionals, students, journalists, and representatives of grassroots and try to increase their capacities and knowledge in terms of the country's European integration. As every organization, we also face uh, quite a lot of challenges uh, when trying to build community resilience. As other CSOs, we, uh, we frequently face uh, sustainability and funding uh, issues. And this has been further exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, yet, uh, although many activities can be performed without much funds, the limited access and uh, to face-to-face -to -face events has further increased. And this is one of the, probably the greatest challenge that we're currently facing as an organization. In terms of uh, additional key activities, so apart from the previously mentioned things that we're doing, Eurothing also engages vastly in lobbying and advocacy, working closely with state institutions whenever possibilities exist. And one of our most recent small wins, so to call them, uh, was also related to our resilience fund supported project. So uh, the public pressure that we managed to exert using our media campaign resulted with the, uh, the national government forming a, a coordination body, which is responsible to combat illegal logging in North Macedonia. Of course, uh, for the time being, this is nothing more than a document. So we'll continue to closely follow the activities of this uh, body. In the past, Eurothink also managed to literally stop the wasteful spending of public money by one state regulatory body, which wanted to build a uh, cantilevered observation wheel, basically something very similar as the London Eye in the Varda River in Skopje. So with our work and reporting and uh, uh, raising awareness, we managed to stop this, uh, this wasteful project. And lastly, what I would want to underline is that a CSO in Macedonia, we try to do everything which is in our power to make state institutions transparent and accountable. And we will continue to invest serious efforts to join the fight against organized crime and corruption, not just in our country, but also regionally going uh, beyond. Thank you very much. And I remain, uh, remain available for any questions uh, and any prospective de debate that we might have today. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ivan. That was really interesting. And I'm sure there are gonna be many questions afterwards um, and we'll get back to you on that. I want to hand over now to Milan Stefanovski who works in Protecta and uh, is based in Niche, Serbia. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Ivan Stefanovic, not Stefanovski, but it's almost the same. Uh, I'm representative of the NGO Protecta from Serbia, from the city of Niš. Uh, on the beginning of this, uh, I would like to thank uh, G uh, Global Initiative for giving me the opportunity to present our work and situation in Serbia and for supporting protect activities for the last few months. Uh, I have been active in the civil sector for 25 years, of which 23 years in the organization of Protecta. Uh, we started our work in the 90s with only two goals, uh, the, the fight against the dictator regime of Slobodan Milosevic and the fight uh, against organized crime, which was mostly organized in the, that time by the state and the politician in power. 
At the time, NGO representatives was threatened by Serbian government uh, uh, as foreign mercenaries and domestic traitors, and we were often arrested for our activities. I have personally been arrested 13 times, mainly for organizing independent election monitoring and for organizing uh, uh, civil protests against the regime. Uh, now, 22 years later, I have the impression that nothing has changed in Serbia. We have now on power literally the same people who was, were in power in the 90s and who advocated uh, nationalism, hate speech wars. Uh, politicians who were uh, then in that time ministers in the government of Slobodan Milosevic, they are now in the position of the president of the Republic or president of the Serbian assembly, etc. All the players uh, are the same, except Slobodan Milosevic who died. Uh, if you ask me what we have been doing for the last 20 years, I will do not know to tell you. I have the impression that I have wasted my life. Uh, democratic progress is minimal and the undemocratic regime is never stronger, if you ask me. Uh, again, we have an autocratic dictatorial regime. Again, one man is stronger than any institution and make decision as he want, not as the law say. Um, once again, we have a government that uh, massively violates its own laws. And again, the civil sector uh, is perceived uh, in media as an enemy of the state. Uh, the anom anom anomalies uh, in society are the same. The teas between organized crime and politicians have never been stronger. The media is under the control of the regime. The opposition has been destroyed totally and has never been weaker. In such condition, it is very difficult to deal with the topic such as the fight against organized crime, advocating for greater human rights uh, or vulnerable groups, or fight uh, crime against crime. Authorities uh, perceive such activities as a direct attack on them and try in every way to intimidate and dis uh, discredit uh, representative of civil society and a few independent media that deal with those topics. Uh, governmental official publicly present lies, threats and uh, insults in the Serbian parliament about NGOs, state in institution, uh, and uh, law are being abused. They also made the list of organizations, NGOs against which extraordinary control of their work and finance is being made. Also, they do that for PECTA, for my organization. Mo mostly this few organizations uh, dealing with the fight against uh, crime and the fight for human rights are being suspected of dealing with the financing of terrorism and money laundering and this type of topic. It is not wonder that only a few dozen organization and 20, 30 organization in Serbia deal with such topics uh, out of uh, 30,000 organizations which are registered. The, the civil sector is simply intimidated. Um, the support of the international community exists, but is not enough. Uh, for some reasons, uh, not only to them, EU, USA, and other international players are cooperating with this Serbian government, and on that way, they give them legitimacy. Um, at the same time, when the EU supports Serbia and invests hundreds of millions of euros in the development through governmental institution, the representative of that same government of Serbia are publicly accused on non-governmental organization to receive money from the same EU in order, in order to destroy Serbia and the legal order in, in our country. In this schizophrenic situation, the civil sector feel a lack of strong support and protection of international institution. Uh, there are no domestic funds to support fight against organized crime 
and support for projects provided by the international community is often for a short period of few months only, after which uh, the organization are left uh, to fight uh, for themselves. A couple of months for a serious project and a serious topic is a very short period. And during that time, we make uh, angry some corrupted uh, politicians and make only a few small changes. Then the support of the international community stop and we are left alone to fight for bare existence with an enemy who abuse the law and institution to destroy us. If you work from the capital, Belgrade, you may have some kind of protection due to the presence of the missions of the large number of international institutions like uh, EU, Council of Europe, OSCD, UNDP, USAID, etc. But if you are in the small town, you are left uh, at the mercy of corrupted uh, local politicians. Due to all of this, uh, the topic of the fight against organized crime in Serbia will not be part of agenda and activity of large number of organizations in the coming period. That's my opinion, since this job often looks more like uh, suicide some, some, sometime. Um, I will also say a few sentences about the project that we are implementing with the help of uh, Global Initiative and the uh, Resilience Fund. The project called uh, United and Improved the Community Against Loan Sharking is the first project ever on the topic of combating uh, loan sharking organized by uh, one civil society organization in Serbia. Within the project for the first time in Serbia, a legal center for consulting victims of loan sharking was established. A public campaign on the, this topic was conducted for the first time. Uh, small, small NGOs were educated on the, on the training for the first time to raise their capacities to combat the loan sharking. And for the first time, a survey of the citizens' attitudes uh, and experience on the topic of loan sharking was conducted. Uh, also, uh, we do recommendation for institution, non-government organization and the media of how to fight low, sh uh, fight low sharking, uh, more loan sharking more effectively. Uh, and what is important, all that was done in less than four months, as long as the project lasted. We are very proud of um, and grateful to Resilience Ford for their support. Uh, community resilience on the topic of loan sharking was created from zero initial position. If you ask uh, us in the next few months, we will continue with activity on the topic of uh, combating loan sharking with the new support of the Resilience Ford, uh, Fund. And we will mainly focus our activities on citizens and stating the community resilience on the on this topic uh, uh, of loan sharking in Serbia. The problem of uh, uh, of loan sharking is big. Official data do not exist, and the state don't have any strategy or activities to solve the problem of loan sharking. How much loan sharking is present in everyday life is best best seen in uh, the black chronicle in the media where we have every day a big number of articles about victims of loan sharking. Uh, the standard of living in Serbia is low. Uh, people are economically illiterate. Uh, they often do not meet the basic condition to borrow money from officials from banks. And this is a su su uh, suitable ground for the development of loan sharking. One as a citizen borrow money from loan sharker, he often be in debt for the rest of his life and loses all his property and sometimes uh, his life. Uh, so much for now for me. Uh, later I can give more details about the project or about our other activities uh, for fight against organized crime or about the situation in Serbia. Uh, thanks for your. Thank you very much, Milan. Thank you very much. Um, 
I would like to hand over now to Almira Music. She is working at a Club Masa Mostar in Mostar, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Almira, are you out there? We cannot hear you, Almira. Uh, can you hear yeah. me now? Yes, now we can. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name my name is Almira, and uh, I have uh, more than 15 years experience in uh, non-government organization, uh, working in the vulnerable uh, categories. I work in the Club Mass organization from Mostar. Uh, and we implemented a project called United Against the Crime on the topic of hooliganism uh, with the aim of raising awareness among people uh, about the problem of hooliganism that is uh, present uh, in our society. It really meant a lot to us because uh, issues of hooliganism and violence are affecting our lives. Uh, Mostar is a city in the south of Bosnia and Herzegovina. After the war, it became a symbol of division in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and it is often the target of hooligan conflict. Uh, because of the political obstructions uh, by national parties after 12 years, Mostar uh, held local election uh, and our citizen elected uh, representatives. Uh, this situation leaves a lot of cases of corruption. In the past, uh, there have been a number of incidents is especially in football match between uh, Welsh and Drinsky. Uh, the organization and implementation of the complete project went uh, without major problem, mostly uh, reflecting, reflecting on COVID measures. We are very proud that uh, we successfully realized the project in such hard time with the uh, significant delays. Uh, we were very cautious uh, due to continued spread of COVID in our canton, but our youngsters were, were very active. It is very important to note that in our canton and this reg region, uh, there is none of uh, very few initiatives uh, that are providing space for young people, perhaps especially regarding prevention of crime and violence. More and more, our Mostar becomes a place of violent actions, drug raids, and criminals to socialize. Within our planned activities uh, that gather youngsters from four cities in Herzegovina, Konit, uh, Bileća, Nevesinje, and Mostar. We had the uh, first online Zoom workshop for students and teachers, a uh, public campaign by publishing online displays. <laughs> messages of young people on important threats against crime and hooliganism. Uh, after that essay competition with awards from uh, 12 best essays on prevention, uh, prevention of crime, corruption and hooliganism. Street campaign uh, sharing leaflets uh, uh, with the citizens a uh, forum theater, which we are especially proud. Forum theater is a special de developed uh, tool by UNESCO as a tool for social change. It is not ordinary theater, rather a theater where after official part of play, audience can participate in play and change the outcome of it. 
uh, it was very interesting for young people because it was unusual approach. Uh, we also were very satisfied that young people who played form theater play uh, were ones uh, who were first thinking on, on these problems. Uh, the ones who are ready to act right now and ones who are actually part of some supporters fan clubs. Uh, thanks to additional funding, we made a short documentary on our approach uh, using form theater with the entertainment by young people on why hooliganism is happening and uh, what can we do about it. This documentary is available, uh, available on our YouTube channel as well as on Facebook. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, during the organization of our activities, we saw how much young people are not aware of uh, what hooliganism is and how much informing activities are important. So important component of our project was uh, creating a guide of, uh, for hooliganism and crime, where we put efforts uh, to make this guide readable and interesting to youth, but also to their families, schools, and in general public. As publishing on social media, we also printed it and uh, sharing it with citizens of those participating cities. Uh, we have to share with the partic participants uh, of this webinar that uh, we have good support from our local and cantonal level in sense uh, that our efforts uh, were recognized. And even uh, one of educators for workshops was a representative of Ministry for Education, Culture and Sports of Herzegovina, Neretva Canton. I need to say that this project was only a starting point because the issue of hooliganism and crime in our city and this uh, region is severe. Hooliganists uh, are being used from political structures and make our society unsafe where our children during certain games are not feeling safe to go, to go outside of the house even. We need stronger civil society, but we are lacking for support. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Almira, for sharing your insights on the Mostar and what you're doing. Um, I would quickly like to hand over to uh, Kenan Bardai, who's working at Siri Ivisionit in Kosovo, uh, and share some insights from the local perspective with us. Thank you very much. Uh, just to, uh, uh, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the chance to say something about our, our organization and fight against corruption and organization. Uh, I will try, uh, we, from 20 years, we did a lot of work, but uh, I will try just to, uh, to, to, to explain a few things, few programs that we developed and we think that we had impact on this. Uh, as an organization, since from the beginning, uh, we were gathered uh, through a motto that uh, we had with the Kinzio Bulevar's logo, in the meaning that, uh, that uh, every example, good experience known that worked in the world to try to do, bring this experience in local level and to implement in, uh, in our society. I know that Kosovo during these 20 years went through different stage of development and even as a civil society and our, our organization went through this development too. During this time uh, we developed and implemented different, as I mentioned, different program and project but uh, we believe that uh, the, the, the project and, uh, and programs that uh, will have impact on the, having better uh, transparent and more inclusive in municipality 
will will have impact in lowering uh, corruption and involvement of local officials in organized crime. The programs that uh, we did uh, and developed for years, and we are still working on them, it's uh, we call, for example, active citizenships. What we have done three stroke program is uh, uh, engaging community and village representatives, formal and non-formal groups of the community. We equip them with necessary skills and sets and tools to be agents of their own, uh, agents of change of their own community. We have facilitated through this program, we have facilitated uh, municipality uh, to, to establish local council and these uh, that are composed from small uh, different villages or neighborhoods. And they are uh, uh, formally recognized as uh, actors and uh, representing, uh, uh, representing the, the, those villages and neighborhoods. We have tried to, to, and we have strengthened capacity of local councils. We have lots and lots of examples when a municipality or uh, other donors invest it in their community or villages they represent. We have different examples with each community. Uh, we're monitoring the contract and complaining if something went uh, not as, as it plans uh, uh, these businesses. Most of these complaints is in, uh, went through the, our organization when they come for, for, uh, for our support to, to support them. We're writing requests or complaints towards the institution that are doing the investments. Of course, it's uh, always we do monitor municipality, monitoring the mechanism that are, are in place to prevent and fight the organized crime and corruption. We are part of different networks in, 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 in Kosovo of NGOs that uh, uh, each of us that has any uh, issue or subject uh, that needs uh, needs uh, uh, needs advocacy or needs uh, support from different organizations uh, very fast comes together and, and, and make pressure to an institution. For example, uh, for uh, damaging the river basin, when uh, uh, we as organizations started the initiative that uh, this has to be stopped and had the impact on it. And we have different other examples of these networks that worked uh, and stopped uh, things that uh, uh, we thought that uh, uh, it's um, corruption and in organized crime even behind it. Uh, with resilience fund, uh, what we because most uh, just to, 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 to show you an example that most of uh, cases exposed were uh, local officials or uh, mechanisms that are in place to fight uh, to fight uh, uh, corruption and organized crime were. Uh, um, uh, were exposed for uh, uh, the work between uh, uh, journalists, uh, NGOs, and whistleblowers. That's uh, what uh, we, we uh, wanted to do in, uh, in this um, local level uh, with resilience funds uh, to, to, to strengthen uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 um, representatives of um, media and NGOs. Uh, that were uh, trained about how to monitor uh, to monitor uh, uh, con public contract procurement and uh, uh, trying to how to, to, to strengthen the uh, capacity, how to identify uh, uh, cases where local officials are uh, are involved in criminal in criminal uh, organized crime. Uh, it, but the trainers, uh, we tried to to find the trainer which have um, even even experience in, in these cases uh, we, uh, for organized crime we, we hired a trainer that uh, was one of the train uh, one of the generalists that exposed uh, when a politician and police uh, were involved in 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 uh, in, in, uh, in organized uh, uh, illegal casinos organizing illegal casinos in Kosovo so it was a very good uh, example how it can be identified uh, what kind of networks you have to be in and how to to uh, uh, to treat this information whistleblowers and ngos that gave you information and then how to expose them uh, we uh, we know that uh, building uh, uh, building a community resilience and building community that responds uh, and report towards corruption organized crime it takes time it takes efforts, it takes persistence, it helps from partners, donors, and much more. Uh, it's not easy, and it, it comes even sometimes, as Milan mentioned, that you think that your job is going uh, down to the hill, but uh, always you come to the point that you think that uh, you've done quite a lot through these 20 years. 
just an example, probably that um, uh, Kosovo just had an election uh, some weeks ago, and uh, the party uh, that uh, will never, uh, never had the government, and it was promoting that they will fight uh, corruption, organized crime. Uh, they won more than the 50 percent of the election. Uh, that uh, with the system of election that we have, uh, we thought that this will never be possible to be done. But it's done, and we think that it's a job of every uh, civil society organization, even our uh, uh, job that we have done quite a lot of uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, awareness of citizens about the corruption that exists in, in Kosovo. It's not just, uh, uh, just not that uh, we think that it is corruption, but it is corruption and crim uh, criminal. Uh, organized crime that come, it brought us to this point. Of course, we are aware that um, uh, the, uh, the corruption and organized crime will not uh, stop even that this, uh, this came to this point, but uh, uh, even our work will not stop and uh, other NGOs and civil society and journalists will not stop. This is just a few things that I try to, to mention. I need more details in every uh, uh, what I uh, work, uh, what I explained or different uh, issues. I will be there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kenan, and thanks to all of our uh, representatives from civil society in the region. We've heard some sobering views, but also some inspiring stories, and um, some very concrete examples of the kind of work that you do taking action on environmental issues, uh, anti-corruption education and campaigns, working with youth, uh, a ra raising awareness on loan sharking, looking at the uh, financial aspects of crime and corruption. And there are plenty more stories, uh, plenty more examples in the report and on the videos. If you're interested, please check that out. I must say, I'm not a big fan of video meetings, but one advantage is that we have 130 people here from uh, all over the Western Balkans, Western Europe, even other parts of the world, people jumping in in the chat saying hello from Jerusalem and other places. So there are advantages of, of video conferences, and one of them is to strengthen the sense of uh, uh, a network, a community, and, and solidarity. And uh, it's also... Uh, easier sometimes to get people who might otherwise have had to fly to a meeting and uh, who have very busy schedules. And in that respect, I'm, I'm very happy that we have with us this morning, Dunja Miatovic, who's from Bosnia and Herzegovina, but has uh, now in the past uh, almost decade, I would say, been an international civil servant as representative on freedom of the media for the OSCE and now in her capacity as Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe. Great to see you, Dunja. Great to see you too, Walter. Hi. I was hoping that uh, to get our conversation started, you could give us a few impressions from uh, what you've heard from our, our speakers and about the presentation. And based on your experience, what can be done to build resilience within civil society uh, and particularly the media, but NGOs more broadly speaking, to deal with this issue of organized crime and corruption. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Um, greetings to all. Uh, I hope you're all well and healthy. Um, greeting many uh, participants. It's good to see that there is a huge interest. I'm also greeting many friends that I cannot see all, but I can see many names uh, of uh, people uh, I know for a very long period of time and I worked with on many issues uh, that uh, we are discussing today. Uh, I'm really grateful for reaching out, uh, Walter and Christina, uh, in order for me to take part uh, in this useful and timely uh, discussion on strengthening resilience uh, of civil society organizations in the Western Balkans. So even uh, there is a clear fact that you mentioned it uh, already, uh, Walter, several times, yes, I'm very busy. But when it comes to these topics and the issues you are discussing today, they are on top of my priorities. And this is something uh, I do care uh, personally, but also professionally very much particularly when it comes to the part of the world that I come from, so the Western Balkan, as we are called. 
And I think this report that has been launched today um, in a way defines the ecosystem of crime in the Western uh, Balkans as a joint venture relationship between state structures and criminal groups uh, where organized crime and corruption are closely linked. Some of your statements and um, testimonies in a way uh, is uh, nothing new to me. Uh, but it is over and over again um, of great concern, uh, and it is actually showing the reality we are living in, particularly during this unprecedented time of uh, pandemic and the challenges we are facing as a society uh, on so many uh, issues. Uh, this is a useful a reminder of the context in which civil society organizations and human rights defenders have to operate in the region. Uh, the presentations uh, that we have heard gave us some insights uh, into the challenges facing civil society organizations and human rights defenders and journalists uh, working on issues related to corruption and organized crime. Unfortunately, in my work, I have observed such challenges uh, in a growing number of European countries, so much beyond the Western Balkan region. In addition to being impacted by the general uh, negative tendencies which affect human rights uh, defenders across Europe, uh, members of civil society who fight impunity, organized crime uh, and corruption are particularly exposed to various forms of reprisal for their legitimate activities. And all this, even um, uh, if you look at the uh, statistics that Christina told us that less than 1% of civil societies in the Western Balkans work on fighting, exposing uh, organized crime and corruption, we are still facing this uh, huge problem. Civil society uh, activists, members of uh, human rights uh, NGOs, uh, academics, lawyers, uh, journalists working in these fields face threats, harassment, smear and stigmatization in the media and online surveillance, which we should not forget, uh, including in the digital sphere, physical violence um, and uh, abduction and even killings across the continent. So these are all documented uh, cases. These are all cases uh, that I'm personally aware of because of the network that we have at the office and the work uh, my team and I are constantly engaging with human rights defenders and journalists across the continent and beyond. Furthermore, uh, with law enforcement officials increasingly resorting to disproportionate use of force, uh, when policing demonstrations in recent years, and particularly last year, we were able to see this change, human rights uh, defenders are at enhanced risks uh, when exercising freedom of assembly. Uh, and I have also noted uh, various forms uh, of administrative and judicial harassment, such as unlawful uh, arrests, uh, detentions and criminal prosecution on dubious and or unfounded grounds used to silence, uh, um, punish human rights defenders and activists for carrying out their invaluable, uh, courageous work uh, in defense of our common uh, democratic values. So I have observed in this context an increasing use uh, of some European governments, uh, by some European governments of anti-terrorism and money laundering legislation to intimidate civil society actors, which I think is important to mention uh, today. Several such worrying examples are mentioned in the report. Uh, one relates to the publication last year uh, by the administration for the prevention of money laundering of the Serbian Ministry uh, of Finance of a list of media and civil society organizations um, uh, it wanted to probe for money laundering and financing of terrorism, which UN experts considered to be a misuse of the relevant legislation. Um, many issues that uh, uh, Milan mentioned uh, in his uh, uh, statement in the, during introduction uh, were really uh, of great concern and something that my office is following closely when it comes to intimidation and harassment of human rights defenders and civil society 
um, in Serbia. Examples from other Council of Europe member states of such actions include Turkey, where anti-terrorism legislation con has consistently been used to restrict NGOs' work and silence human rights defenders. Last week, um, I published uh, an exchange of letters uh, with the uh, the Turkish Minister of Interior concerning a new piece of legislation which further restricts uh, uh, the already limited space uh, in which NGOs and human rights defenders have to operate under the pretext uh, of the fight uh, against uh, terrorism. Another uh, important um, issue uh, raised in the Global um, Initiatives report relates to access to funding, and it was mentioned by many of you. Uh, access to funding for civil society organizations. It is regrettable uh, that the main source of funding of NGOs in the region, in the Western Balkans, uh, remains international uh, donations, and that the result of this external support of short-term uh, donor-driven projects rather uh, than long-term strategic uh, work. It is also worrying to note uh, that a large share of government funds intended for civil society is actually distributed to so-called gongos uh, that Christina uh, mentioned in her introduction. So the organizations actually that are set up or sponsored by governments. Uh, I'm very much aware of this uh, shift or, or this, uh, you know, really dangerous challenge, particularly uh, I learned a lot uh, about work of Gongos during my time um, at the OSC until 2017, and I know how dangerous it is for any society. Unfortunately, this problem affects civil society organizations across Europe, and concerns have been raised uh, with me by NGOs about changes in the practice of distributing public funds, which prioritize organizations that are close uh, to governments and exclude independent civil society organizations, independent, outspoken uh, civil society organizations. While it is true uh, that the space for NGOs has been shrinking, uh, uh, it often only shrinks vis-a-vis -vis independent civil society organizations and human rights defenders who openly disagree with government policy. So sometimes when we are presented uh, with some statistics by the governments, it actually doesn't, we, we do not see the real picture, uh, the real shrinking space uh, of, the, of the society. You rightly pointed out the important role played by journalists uh, in the fight against corruption and organized crime. And as uh, many of you know, this is particularly important. Uh, for me, um, it was important and is still important in uh, my career. Um, and uh, I emphasize this, all, this aspect also in a human rights comment from last January, where I addressed uh, the ways in which corruption undermines human rights and the rule of law. Um, as I noted in this comment, the killings, and I think it's important that we mention those names over and over again, the killings of the journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta and Jan Kuciak and his fiancée in Slovakia are emblematic of the risks that the journalists take uh, to expose corrupt politicians and their links uh, to organized crime so that they can be held accountable. Uh, I also noted in my comment that CRIC, the Crime and Corruption Reporting Network in Serbia, that is again in the headlines all over the region and beyond, have received death threats and were targeted by a smear campaigns. I am very concerned about the recent smear campaign against CRIC, led by some media and tabloids, uh, and the fact that some Serbian parliamentarians uh, and politicians openly uh, joined this campaign. I also noted in my comment that CRIC, uh, who have carried out important work in exposing links between politicians and organized crime, have received death threats and were targeted by smear campaigns. I'm very concerned about the recent uh, campaign, uh, and I think uh, this is uh, something that I'll continue to follow. I have listened with interest to presentations about the work of NGOs on, on environmental crimes, uh, which provided a perspective from North Macedonia, 
promotion and protection of uh, human rights related to a clean environment is an issue of great importance to me. I have urged uh, member states to ensure the safety of human rights defenders working on uh, environmental issues and enabling conditions for their work. Uh, in a round table with uh, environmental human rights defenders that my office organized in December 2020, I learned about shocking uh, myriad of ways in which private and government actors can limit their actions and target them for their commitment to a clean environment. This includes, of course, the marginalization uh, and criminalization of legitimate activities of environmental NGOs, sanctions, limited access to funding, and various other forms of reprisal affect their physical safety, uh, liberty, and integrity. Uh, the report on this uh, event is forthcoming, and I intend to continue to work in this field. So I'm inviting you to follow um, my Twitter account, my personal one, and my institution's Twitter account in order to um, follow uh, the work on the environmental um, uh, human rights defenders and many other issues that are forthcoming. Corruption um, erodes uh, trust in public institutions, and I know that we all agree on this. Uh, it hinders economic development and has a disproportionate impact on the enjoyment of human rights particularly by people belonging to marginalized uh, or disadvantaged uh, groups, such as minorities, uh, people with disabilities, LGBTI, refugees, migrants, and prisoners. Uh, it also disproportionately affects women, uh, children, and people living uh, in poverty, in particular by hampering their access to basic social uh, rights, such as healthcare, housing, and education. This is why strengthening the capacity of NGOs to work effectively on preventing corruption, exposing cases of corruption, and holding governments to account in this regard is of great, crucial importance for the protection of human rights and upholding the rule of law. Societies needs NGOs and human rights defenders. Societies needs you to do your work freely and safely in order to become resilient and reach public debate and pluralism, involve citizens in public life, contribute proposals that can address the major challenges facing our societies today, preserve peace and better um, uh, the lives to, of, of everyone. Therefore, I have always stressed the importance of protecting freedom of association and expanding the space uh, in which civil society organization uh, operate. In order to be activists, to be a member of, of the civil society organization, apart from be willing to engage in this, you need courage, you need wisdom. And, and I'm uh, very proud to know uh, so many of you trying to make our societies uh, better. This is not easy task. And apart from having support that you already have, there is a need to do more. As a commissioner, I have a specific duty uh, concerning the support of human rights defenders, their protection and the enabling of an environment for their activities. My predecessors also did a great work in order to empower your work. Uh, I also intervene and interact with national authorities uh, to look for solutions to the problems faced by human rights defenders, especially in serious situations that require urgent actions. As you know, I often join my voice uh, and I give voice to voiceless in the situation when human rights defenders and journalists are in danger. I meet on a regular basis uh, with a wide range of human rights defenders and I report publicly on their situation. I also try to organize as many events, particularly in these uh, challenging times, uh, like this round table I mentioned, which provide human rights defenders and NGOs with an opportunity for networking and enhancing strategic cooperation with key international stakeholders, as well as for enforcing links and cooperation uh, with my office. And one important tool at the end that I would like to mention um, that I have at my disposal is the possibility of intervening in cases before the European Court of Human Rights. And I have used this tool in respect to human rights defenders and their work in several Council of Europe member states already 
on several occasions in the past uh, three years. I will continue to do so. Uh, and uh, I think it is extremely important to uh, assure you that uh, um, I will continue to be an ally uh, of civil society organizations and human rights defenders who take a stance against injustice, promote human rights and societies without discrimination, free of corruption and uh, organized crime. So I wish you strength and courage in your important work. Uh, please stay in touch. Uh, we are very approachable institution, work together with my team, share information, and I wish you a wonderful uh, discussion uh, and also uh, courage and uh, dedication in your extremely uh, important work, particularly now during pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dunya, with, uh, with your words from the heart, from experience, and also from the region. And I think it's so important for civil society actors and those who support them to know that they have champions like you in uh, multilateral organizations. And there was a question in the chat from Gudrun saying, you know, what, what do organizations really do to hold leaders to account? But I think what you have described certainly shows what the Council of Europe and what your role can play uh, in, in strengthening integrity and and calling people out. You mentioned uh, the case of Creek. Boyana has put some more information about that in the chat. Um, we have now about 15 minutes for questions and answers. I'm just looking at a few here. Some relate more generally to organized crime and the Western Balkans, the role of criminal groups from the Western Balkans outside the region. These are all interesting questions, but not so much on the topic that we're looking at today have put a suggestion for a link to a report that we've written called Transnational Tentacles that you might want to check out. Um, I would be interested to hear from Albania because we haven't heard from a civil society representative from Albania to also get that perspective. I know that there are at least two colleagues out there who helped us with the report um, Alketa, do you want to say something from your perspective? Or Arlinda? Or not? Hello? <laughs> yes, please. Hello. Um, so my name is Arlinda. I don't know. Uh, oh, okay, you hear me. Uh, I want to thank you for the possibility of uh, talking about it. Actually, we have worked in Albania in the city of Dibra, in the region of Dibra. It's a region that is considered uh, one of the sources of the young people that are involved in organized crime. So uh, we have tried to, to see things in a, a different perspective. So uh, apart from um, raising the awareness on uh, organized crime and uh, understanding what organized crime is, uh, we have tried to give them positive models. So uh, we have worked with young people in Dibra to show them how their city is and uh, how much their city offers employment possibilities. Because uh, Dibra region is a um, uh, is a poor region in Albania, and so people usually are prone to see the, those uh, rich persons who have a lot of cars and a lot of houses in uh, two years or three that they have worked, for example, in Great Britain, where there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of Albanians uh, included in organized crime. So um, we have seen this as a positive approach. Uh, what we have uh, faced is uh, the lack of information, and it was mentioned a lot even by uh, other uh, organizations in other uh, countries, a lack of uh, information of young people, but even of uh, responsible institutions about organized crime, uh, which we have uh, seen as a possibility to go on and uh, uh, work again on Debra uh, related to organized crime. 
So, uh, so far, we think that uh, we had for three months that we worked there, we had uh, positive results. Uh, we have linked uh, young people with uh, local businesses. Uh, uh, we have ourselves seen a lot of uh, uh, local businesses that was successful and they had the possibility to employ other young people, but uh, they need uh, a bit of more promotion. So uh, even people abroad or uh, outside their region and even outside Albania could see their uh, great potential. So in uh, in this regard, we think that we have achieved a bit of, uh, we have changed a bit the mentality of young people about uh, leaving uh, the city of Dubra or leaving Albania and going abroad. Uh, we should mention the fact that um, people live in Albania is actually uh, a big problem here. Uh, but uh, we hope, uh, we don't hope to stop it, but we hope to, to give it uh, uh, for people to think uh, twice, actually, before they start thinking of living in Albania and going to the other countries, because actually we, are, uh, we want to give them uh, another possibility. Because being here with their people and having uh, a positive um, idea about what to do with their life, after the 18 years old where they have to work and to take care about families, uh, when they have another choice, uh, we think that they would uh, prefer to stay here and work and be successful than go abroad and uh, be involved in organized crime. So, uh, uh, Sorry, uh, I have uh, Blertina here, who was the project coordinator in Dibra, and she's telling me something more. <laughs> yes, uh, she says that uh, it has uh, it was a successful project there because the young people were very enthusiastic to to be part of this project there and to learn more about uh, what was happening really in their countries. Uh, it's a pity that they didn't know the existence of these local businesses there that was successful and they had a lot more than uh, over a decade that were working successfully on the region. Uh, and uh, yeah, there were a lot of the young people who uh, before when we contacted them, they were uh, hoping to, to go abroad, especially in London. And so we think that we did good with targeting this area because, as I mentioned before, uh, Great Britain is one of the uh, points that uh, actually is talking about Albanian Mafia. So uh, this was what we have done and what we hope to do in the future regarding the organized crime in this region. Though there are other regions in Albania who are poor too and who do, uh, have faced the same problems and we hope that in the future we can um, expand the activity even in the other regions. Great, thanks very much. And Thank I you. think uh, your response, Erlinda, helps to address Vanessa's question in the chat, which is what more can CSOs do to help uh, stop brain drain? And in our project, we actually made a point of trying to get in touch with and support CSOs from smaller towns, from outside the capitals, because we also see a, an issue of in-country migration, people leaving small towns to go to big cities or leaving communities like Debra that was just uh, described to, to go abroad looking for better opportunities, but sometimes at a very young age with very little education and no skills and becoming very vulnerable to organized crime. And I think also some of the things that Almira was describing, what's being done in Mostar, helping uh, young people stay away from trouble in their community, but also from falling into the hands of uh, kind of predatory criminal groups. Um, there's a question uh, from Murat asking about high-level corruption. Ivan, do you want to address that issue? What more can be done to um, uh, put attention on high-level corruption cases involving members of the government? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Well, uh Organizations primarily must try, uh, Christina already uh, underlined this, must try and co collaborate more with investigative journalists, but also try to, to empower them. 
For example, this is why we introduced this school of European politics six or seven years ago, as uh, I already mentioned in, uh, in my expose. Basically, it's, um, it's important to, to strengthen the capacities of CSOs, because this is, this is a complicated thing. It needs a lot of research. It, it needs a lot of institutional knowledge, for example, of how, on how the Freedom of Information Act works, where you can find information, what you're entitled to get and what you're not entitled to get. And it also takes uh, some courage and institutional protection in terms of having, having some sustainable and reliable donor who would always be here to basically uh, watch your back. Because, uh, for example, I can share I can share some of uh, Eurothink's stories from several years ago, during Gurevsky's regime, and it was not just Eurothink but seven eight other organizations. We were uh, we were um, constantly put through financial inspections and accusations for money laundering and embezzlement. Uh, of course, nothing nothing tangible was found, and uh, then after the change of uh, of power uh, charges were dropped, but this is a significant pressure. And this is something that uh, Serbian colleagues face uh, nowadays. And I, I foresee that it's going to be much, much tougher for, for Serbian organizations in times to come. Basically, uh, CSOs need to be uh, to show greater levels of solidarity because when one is being attacked, you know, tomorrow, the government is going to come to your door so that this these colleagues or neighbors are not going to be the only ones attacked eventually regimes will come after you especially when you try to expose uh their dirty wrongdoings so it's organization capacity building and increasing of capacity but also working with citizens because they they are they are our partners for example for our illegal logging projects project, we talked to people in the field. We spoke also to ecologists, professionals, people from the state institutions working uh, uh, with the um, wooden mass on local level, but the crucial information we, the crucial information we got that we could later triangulate with official information was from citizens who were directly or indirectly, uh, victims of illegal logging. For example, organized criminal groups would trespass into their uh, privately owned land and illegally log their timber. So they, they were willing to help us. People who have suffered corruption often come and, and uh, give us information, but we need to react. For example, uh, recently, recently uh, we had a situation where um, uh, uh, our acquaintances came and told us about cases uh, where illegal construction was uh, was being performed in Skopje, and that some of owners of pro private land were tricked by an investor, and they were uh, people who are not very competent in handling legal docu documents were forced into signing documents, being misled by the investor and currently they live they live in apartments they do, then uh, that they do not own and the investor is making them pay rent to him and you have these similar cases all around the western balkans yeah. and beyond so it's organization solidarity resources and uh, increasing of capacities I'll thanks ivan Thanks, and I think that really accentuates the, the point that we tried to bring out in the title of our report, Stronger Together, the importance of networks within civil society, within countries, but also across the region. And um, also referring to a couple of comments made in the chat, let's be clear, we're not suggesting that civil society organizations should take on a kind of full frontal assault against organized crime that they don't replace the role of the police or the prosecution. These are civil society organizations trying to strengthen resilience in their community, trying to make their, their uh, communities a better place, which is about small projects that we've uh, highlighted here. 
but also uh, the kind of solidarity that Ivan was talking about, uh, empowering people, standing up for the truth, uh, standing up for the rule of law, the, the message that Dunya uh, was giving to us today. So I'd like to thank all of the civil society organizations who took part in uh, the creation of this report, uh, and especially to those who've joined us today. I'd like to again thank our donor uh, who made this possible, and to again uh, stress the point that Ivan made about the, the need for sustainable and reliable support, financial, but also in terms of know-how, political backing, to know that there's somebody there, particularly if you're in an isolated community. Uh, remember what Milan was saying, that it's one thing if you're in the capital, but you're much more vulnerable if you're outside of the capital. Uh, I'd like to thank Christina uh, for all the work that she's done on this project and our colleagues in the Resilience Fund to Dunya for joining us today, and for all of you for taking some time, uh, clearly demonstrating your interest in this topic, either because you're active in it or curious or um, trying to do more to support the types of work that's being done through civil society organizations. If you're interested in the work that we do more generally, please sign up to our mailing list. You can see a link there in the chat. Uh, please have a look at the report if you haven't done so already and the video. Stay safe and thanks again for joining us. Have a good afternoon and a great weekend.